By Mark 21.00.00, it could be considered a safe statement that many of the survivors of Kalth had resigned themselves to death under the light of the Viridian Star. It should not be taken as a surrender to melancholy, indeed far from it. The Astartes of the 13th Legion Ultramarines continued to comport themselves with the utmost discipline and dedication relentlessly applying themselves to the immediate practicalities of their situations, but for many, their fates now seemed clear. Whatever recompense they were to earn would be bought from the enemy in blood and destruction, and they would count it good. All, however, was not lost. The battle was not yet won by the traitorous 17th Legion and their allies. As one has elucidated upon previously, the word bearers, despite being in a position of near total tactical and strategic superiority from the very moment of their betrayal, had, at least in base military terms, squandered this position in favor of their pursuit of matters altogether more esoteric. While the full extent of these eldritch machinations were yet to birth, it had allowed the 13th Legion an iota of room to regroup, reinforce, and begin to plan. The Ultramarines, of course, were led by one of the greatest planners in Imperial history, and Robot Gulliman, recovered now from his imprisonment in the thin atmospheric shell surrounding his flagship, was striving to develop the situation into something that would deliver his legion from annihilation. The key to victory, or perhaps more accurately, the key to survival, past the next several hours, lay in the usurped planetary defense grid. The thousands of weapons emplacements, both on the planet's surface and in orbit, had been captured by the word bearers earlier in the battle, and turned by the traitor Mechanicum to the command of Kor Phaeron. Since then, the first captain of the 17th Legion had wielded the grid not only to punish ultramarine orbital and ground forces, but to murder the entire Viridian system. While slaved to traitor control, no significant muster of force could be managed by the Ultramarines, as Corpheron would immediately retask the grid to punish and annihilate. Thanks to Marius Gage's recapture of the McCrag's Honor's secondary bridge, Gilliman was able to coordinate planning with the largest Loyalist force that had established contact from the surface that of 4th Company Captain Remus Ventanus. Ventanus had, during the course of the battle, linked up with Mir Edvd Torin, who was believed to be the most senior surviving Mechanicum adept on Kalth. From Torin, the captain, and latterly his Primarch, had learned that a data engine, potentially the only one on Kalth not infected by pernicious scrap code, lay within the Lanshire Guildhall. This engine would allow Loyalist Mechanicum to re-establish the new sphere, and thus control over Kalt's networked weapons emplacements. But this would only be possible if control was also taken from the Data Overseer engine currently being used by the word bearers to command the grid. This engine locus was currently in Zetsun Verid Yard, the last surviving orbital shipyard, and the base of operations for Kor Phaeron. The attack on Zetsun Verid would be led by Gilliman himself. While the Primarch acknowledged that his role was as a general, not a warrior, he nevertheless stated to Marius Gage that he would not allow any of his sons to deny him the satisfaction of killing the first captain of the word bearers with his own hands. Ventanus's attack began with a rapid advance in force into the ruins of Lanshire City. The formations he possessed were heterogeneous, a diverse mix of imperial military elements. The majority was of the captain's own fourth company survivors, supported by solar auxilia, exertus regiments, and mechanicum tagmata elements under Majos Torin and Skitarii Marshal Aruk Serutit. It was a motley assortment of survivors, to be sure, swept up into Ventanus's mission 
by sheer luck and fate. The remnants of the Nereid Tenth marched alongside Mechanicum Tech Priests under the massive bulk of Shadow Sword Super Heavy Tanks, while at the vanguard, Ventanus led a wing of 13th Legion Land Raiders. Their first detected opposition was also their first kill, a sole Warhound Scout Titan of the Legio Mortis. The engine was alone and unsupported. Its princeps had clearly been granted leave to indulge their darkest destructive fantasies on Lanshire City, and for this, they would pay. Despite pushing its void shields to maximum, the Warhound's force bubble popped under a hurricane of fire from Predator, Whirlwind, and Sikaran tanks, before a pinpoint strike from a Shadow Sword ended its wretched existence. The portentous engine kill marked the start of the engagement. Ventanus' forces fell upon the word-bearer defenders of the Guildhall with the fury of the betrayed. Ultramarine discipline and cohesion kept barely in check in the face of a fury most righteous. Word-bearer Gal Vorbach reaped a fearsome tally from the attackers, but the rage of Ultramar would not be denied. Ventanus' forces captured the Guildhall and delivered the Mechanicum to their work. Their success was buoyed by the arrival of new allies. The 111th and 112th companies, bereft of their command cadres, had been led to the guild hall by a single sergeant named Anshees, while Captain Athon of the 19th company, so-called the Honored, also arrived. A whole mortal host soon, too, made their presence known, led by ultramarine tetrarch Ikos Lamiad, as well as the honored dreadmark Telemachus. The reprieve, welcome as it was, would be short-lived. Auspex feeds registered a massive inbound enemy force, led by Hall Belloth. Despite the Mechanicum's possession of the data engine, the corresponding overseer engine in Zetsun Verid had yet to be freed from wordbearer control. Unless it was, the efforts of Ventanus's companies would be for nothing, and Hall Belloth's wordbearers would annihilate them within the hour. Yet in orbit, the second half of the 13th Legion's desperate gambit was now underway. Gilliman himself led a teleport assault from the McCrag's honor to the Zetson Verid orbital. The flagship could in no way risk movement for fear of alerting the weapons grid. So dangerous a maneuver was now the only one left at the Primarch's disposal. The sheer range of the teleport would draw so much power from the ship and shunt so much of it through the ancient systems that they would surely overload, rendering extraction by this method impossible. It was a final gambit, and was understood as such. Failure would see the Primarch dead, Kalth lost, and the Legion nigh exterminated. The risk was the only course possible for Gilliman. Without control of the weapons grid, his Legion would simply die regardless. It was only a matter of time. The battle between the Primarch and the Master of the Faith was unlike anything hitherto seen in the Age of Darkness. Corpheron had ascended to becoming a debased magister of the powers of the Warp. He had drunk deep from the cups of sorcerous might, and the full scale of his present abilities were unleashed upon Gilliman as soon as the Ultramarines attacked the command center. Invested with the responsibility by Lorgar himself for the Kalth operation, Corpheron withheld nothing, blasting Astartes to ash with warp-spawned maledictions, before turning upon Gilliman himself. Even the Primarch was rendered near helpless before the sorcery of the Master of the Faith. Driven to his knees by a beam of blackest unlight, Gilliman was sprung upon by Corpheron, who pressed the blacked flint of an athame to his throat. This cursed dagger was one of the eight shards of the Anathema blade, forged by the Xenos Kinebrach and stolen by word-bearer's first chaplain Erebus at the outset of the Interrex crisis. The selfsame blade had been used to mortally wound Horus Lupercal upon the moons of Davin, delivering the Primarch to that world's sinister lodge priests for care. Its new blasphemous children had been wielded by several individuals throughout the Battle of Kalth, 
and one was now poised to reap the life of a Primarch. However, at the exact moment when the killing blow could have been struck, Corfaeron stayed his hand, instead choosing to whisper into Gilliman's ear an offer he had no authority to make, yet did so regardless. Faeron promised Gilliman a place within the works of primordial annihilation, a place of great honor amongst the ranks of the Dark Pantheon's followers. All the 13th Primarch had to do was pledge himself to the worship and devotion of Chaos. But for his word, the Master of the Faith offered him a place within a new universal order, and all the power that came with it. Gilliman said nothing. His armored fist cannoned into Kor Faron's torso. The 13th Primarch's response to the sibilant offer was to tear Kor Faron's still beating heart from his body and cast its ruin upon the cold metal deck. At the Lanshear Guildhall, salvation began to rain from the heavens. In blinding columns, lance beams seared planetward, but they did not impact the beleaguered defenders. The might of the Kalth defense grid was turned instead upon the traitor host, and in an instant, extinction had been turned to retribution. An immediate, planet-wide counterattack was mounted on every major word-bearer force currently operational. Orbital strikes rained hell upon the traitor hosts, punishing each and every one in extremis. Still reeling from the wrath of the defense grid, these forces were now set upon by vengeful loyalists, Astartes, Mechanicum, Exertus units rising up against their attackers in near unison. This was not just merely upon the surface. In orbit, word-bearer ships that had ruled Kalth near space unchallenged now had the weapons grid turned against them. The platforms had been designed to fend off a threat approximate to a full battle fleet in proper standing order. The scattered word-bearer ships, which for a near full day had been gleefully hunting helpless targets of opportunity, were now annihilated in kind. Vessels of the 17th Legion that had centuries of service perished in instants, torn into by the unbridled fury of the weapons grid. Still choked with the carcasses of the Ultramarine's Grand Fleet, those perished loyalists in orbit were joined by the wreckage of their attackers. The sheer volume of debris the 13th Legion counterattack now added to would create an artificial set of rings for Kalth. The planet, becoming encircled with the corpses of those ships that had fallen in the Great Betrayal forevermore. On the bridge of the Infidus Imperator, it is known that Corferon manifested shortly into the counterattack. Still somehow alive in the aftermath of having his heart torn from his chest, it is believed the Master of the Fate survived through sheer mastery of warpcraft. He was, however, apparently in no fit state to issue commands. It was the shipmaster of the 17th Legion craft, Antonius Antwark, that ordered the vessel's disengagement from the battle, reasoning that their contributions to the betrayal and its arcane significance had been accomplished within reasonable parameters. The Infidus Imperator came about and made full burn for the nearest Mandeville point. Aboard the McCrag's honor, its flight was immediately spotted by the Sensorium Adepts and reported to Marius Gage, who in turn raised his victorious Primarch on Zetsun Verid. Absolutely unwilling to allow the ship, and presumably Kor Faron, to escape, Gilliman ordered Gage to mount an immediate pursuit aboard the honor. Both vessels vanished into an unknown warp disturbance at the edge of the system. Their fates would remain unknown for years to come. Gilliman himself would not learn of the fate of his flagship, his first chapter master, or his loathsome enemy for quite some time. And indeed, the full tale of this insane clash must be reserved for another record. Although the Ultramarines had mounted a stunning last-minute reversal of fortune, 
this was not victory by any means. A delegation of counselors, led by a group of Mechanicum adepts, surviving fleet navigators, and clearly traumatized astropaths, petitioned Gilliman for time, for dire portents had emerged that required the Primarch's immediate attention. The Viridian Star had, during the hours of the weapons grid being in word-bearer hands, been explicitly targeted by the 17th Legion, along with the remaining stellar bodies in the system that they had murdered. Likely through the use of specialized ammunition, the traitors had inflicted horrific damage to the star's fusion reaction. Whatever they had seeded into its mass, it had caused Viridia to begin outputting increasingly lethal levels of radiation. The poisoned solar winds were now beginning to pummel Kalt's atmosphere, which had already been grievously wounded by almost a full Terran day of continual weapons bombardment and atomic attacks. Not only were its tectonics irreversibly impacted, the sheer amount of smoke unleashed by firestorms that still raged across its continents were choking the skies. The combined effects, the Mechanicum avowed, would, within days, render the planet's surface utterly inviolable for human life. With full evacuation from the planet impossible due to the sheer lack of Legion vessels still operational, not to mention the time involved, the only recourse was the withdrawal of all loyalists still alive upon Kalth to the subterranean arcologies. The planet was rich with a network of tunnels through its porous crust. During its development, many of these had been turned into arcologies, underground cities connected and linked with future expansions already planned. While far from ideal, they were well suited to immediately absorb all surviving civilians, Astartes, and other humans, and could provide at least some shelter from the fury of the now poisoned Viridian Star. Captain Ventanus volunteered to lead this operation without hesitation. His fate now seemingly irrevocably bound to the planet, the Master of the Fourth Company announced over every open Vox channel that this was a Primarch's directive. The fleet, or what remained of it, would embark to what craft they could the remaining surface armor units, as well as what god engines of the Collegia Titanica were still operational. Even as this was being conducted, the navigators and astropaths of the Legion brought the Primarch yet more dire news. Pleas for aid from across the entirety of Ultramar. Kalth, it appeared, was the beginning of a much larger conflict. The 500 worlds were being assailed by, according to reports, not merely the word bearers, but the 12th Legion world eaters, and their Primarch, Angron. Dozens of systems and Ultramarines forces were reporting the same dire situation. This was no less than a full scale invasion. Kalth, Gilliman grimly surmised, had merely been an opportunity to exterminate the bulk of the Ultramarines Legion, allowing the traitors to then conquer and reave nigh unopposed through the jewels of the Eastern Fringe. In this, they had essentially failed. The Legion and its liege were very much alive and could be rallied, but the price they would pay and had paid was undoubtedly dire. Almost 120,000 Ultramarines lay dead, with a further 20,000 crippled and in dire need of Medicaid care. In many ways, the word bearers had succeeded. It could hardly be argued that they had not. The final piece of information for Gilliman was altogether more difficult to comprehend in scope, but no less pressing for it. The navigators were reporting that the currents of the warp were becoming extremely restive. The tides of the immaterium, insignificant flux. For whatever reason, these disturbances were centered around Kalth and the Viridian system. At best estimate, the fleet's navigators surmised that the system would become cut off from the wider galaxy by an oncoming storm of unprecedented power, and that the storm may in fact be spreading outwards. Already capricious this past year, the rising warp instability sealed Gilliman's course for him. Once the final units could be embarked from the surface, those warp-capable ships would flee the system. 
at Kalth Mark 23.43.00. Remus Ventanus glimpsed to the surface of the world that he suspected would be his very last time. Loyalist Mechanicum elements, mostly the remnants of Archmagos Karn Barbarell's Tagmata, took the brunt of the final phases of the retreat, far more resilient as they were to the effects of increasingly debilitating radiation. Unfortunately for the Loyalists, the traitor forces still alive upon Kalth had read the signs, and had heard Ventanus's proclamation. Where possible, significant elements of word-bearers likewise retreated to the Arcologies. This marks the beginning of the Underground War, a near decade of conflict that would only conclude with the defeat of the traitors on Terra and the end of the Horus Heresy. The betrayal at Kalth did not conclude in the manner of other battles in the Age of Darkness. Not only was the Underground War its dreadful successor, continuing the battles on the planet years after the initial shock of perfidy, the unfolding Shadow Crusade saw Gilliman immediately engaged as soon as the evacuation force made wake. Kalth's tale was the tale of the heresy itself. The last of the 17th Legion was not purged from its tunnels until the fall of the War Master. The Mark of Kalth itself was kept running by the 13th Legion until approximately Mark 219,479.25.03, during the scouring, when Captain Ventanus, hero of the Underground War, led the Ultramarines to Colchis the home world of the word-bearers and Lorgar. With them, they brought death. A planet for a planet was scant recompense. Like the continued running of the Mark, it was a thing of symbolism and little else. Of course, the purging of a warp-tainted population was a matter of significance in the years of the scouring, but the real heft of the matter lay in the base revenge of the act. Symbols, as the Imperium had learned during the Horus Heresy, carried significant weight. The crimes of Lorgar and his legion could not be repaid in the simple death of one world, but Colchis's destruction yet mattered. For the word-bearers themselves, some scholars have speculated that the Mark of Kalth may yet still run, in the depths of the Great Eye or the Maelstrom the countless pockets of blackest treachery to which their craven kind ran. The Mark, too, was not merely that of Ultramarine's battle records, or the obsession of the word-bearers while the Legion still lives. Colloquially, the Mark of Kalth was the name ascribed to severe radiation burns, suffered by the survivors of the betrayal, It was caused by the poisoned light of the Viridian Star. The scarring was distinct and in many cases quite serious, but veterans of the battle would often forgo skin grafts and Medicaid procedures, wearing them as a grim badge of honor. The Mark II also refers to psychological damage endured by those who had survived the treachery of the word-bearers. The trauma of the attack was significant enough to brand itself onto even the psycho-conditioned minds of the Legiones Astartes. Survivors of the massacres formed groups apart from fellow legionaries who had, by virtue of chance, simply not been present at the conjunction. In the broader context, Kalth presaged the wars of the Age of Darkness in ways that would only become evident in dread retrospect. While it was perhaps the last grand, full-scale display of the sheer surprise of concealed treachery, the utter devastation of civil war between Imperial military forces was now writ large upon the scarred, rent surface of an entire, fully populated Imperial world. A star system had been murdered in the space of a day. Billions lay dead in less than 24 hours. This was one system, one world. The battlefield to come was galactic in scale. Until such a time as one may relate further tales of this benighted epoch. 
Ave Imperator. Gloria in excelsis terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.